I don't think there's a, a direct definition of big data I could give you. Um, but in economics, I think it's more regarded as the explosion of data that is available, which is very different from um, what was the case um, only a couple of decades ago. Um, and that definitely has changed both how the discipline works and how empirical research is done. And not only the type of research that's done, but also the methods um, that are being used in doing that research. The type of data, if you what you might consider big data, it, it you you might think about the different types, the fundamentally different data, which it was what is now collected by Facebook or by Sainsbury. Um, the, which is like this tracking, human tracking um, data in a way, which is usually targeted at human behaviour. So it's trying to understand behavioural patterns by agents um, and then forming kind of um, clustering these behaviours together and then forming predictions or making predictions out of that behaviour in order to tailor make uh, advertisements or um, kind of predict consumer behaviour in order to then supply um, that consumer good um, in the right amount at the right time and so on and so forth, so make things more efficient. And I think this is a very new development, so this type of data was not available before. It's fundamentally unstructured, um, which is very different to the data that is uh, collected in, for instance, census data and um, survey data, which could be large scale as well, so it could be the quantities of data were very, very large. Uh, or are very, very large in that type of um, census and survey da data, depending on who's collecting that. Um, but usually it's structured, so you have a predefined questions and they're either answered or you have predefined traits, um, and then there, is data, there are data points collected with regard to these traits. If you read through papers in the 1980s, um, that are published in Econometrica or any of the big journals in Econometrics, they always comment on how long it would take that particular model to be estimated by the fastest computer available at the time. And if you look at these models today, it's almost a joke. So for us, it doesn't, take, it doesn't even take a millisecond anymore to, be es to estimate these models. But back in the days, the fastest computer that would take that fast computer a week or two weeks or a month's time. So the amount of quantitative research or data driven research you could do was quite limited just by the pure uh, availability of computing power. And now I think there's a, there's a new kind of shift with both the, the, the development of computing power and the availability of massive amounts of data. I think the, the entire um, kind of econo economic and econometric discipline is shifting towards hopefully a more empirically led um, approach if you want. The debunking of theories happens all the time, right? It's kind of the, what, what scientists probably call the falsification of uh, theories, right? You always have a paradigm and then you, if you, if you, that paradigm being like the commonly understood reality, so you, you have a theory of what, how reality works, yeah, how, how things happen, and then at some point you gather data and you compare how what, real, what happens in the real world against that theory, and if enough evidence is gathered against that theory, then that theory, hopefully, if uh, we have a good working science, that theory is remodeled. Uh, that was always the case, but I think what happens with big data now is that this might happen quicker and faster. So the Batting, if you want, of these theories is going to be more stringent um, and probably also a bit more cruel because you have that data available so and you have a lot of technically skilled people um, who are trying to, to gather that evidence. Um, but then again, also going back to the toolkits that might be needed in order to analyse that big data, these toolkits might not be fully available yet. So it's it's both that we have these theories out there that need to be compared to reality, but we also need to have theories and methods in order to have like to to kind of summarize reality or or get get a grip on reality. 
um, to then be able to compare reality with these abstract theories. So economics at SOAS is always coming from the perspective of economics being social science. That, can, that does not mean that mathematics, or especially quantitative analysis, doesn't have a place in economics. Um, quantitative analysis probably more than mathematics, uh, because ma math is often overly used in order to cover up things. So there's a lot of like over, um, kind of over complication of, um, of theories. Um, and mathematical proofs, and then the, the conception of the general public is, well, it's mathematically proven, so it has to be true. But for all of this, you both have to go back to the assumption, the underlying assumption, every mathematical model, you need to have assumptions, and when, whether these assumptions are true or not. And even if your mathematical model has to be absolutely consistent internally, it does not mean you have omitted something. And this is kind of like this, this absolute truth claim that economists tend to, to make in a way um, excluded a lot of people from the debate, um, which should not have been done because economics is something that um, affects everyone in, every, in daily life, on a daily life basis, so everyone should be able to take part in the discussion on economics. Mm -hmm. this big data is collected is inherently linked I think these days with the use of the internet or the kind of like how the internet came came about um, and whatever analysis we draw from that type of data that's collected in this like very speedy way um, in a kind of like a like a, this network we all connected with via our phones via our like, wireless LAN whatever at home also creates a very screwed um, view maybe of the world. So now you base the collection of your data solely on the basis of um, a couple of technologies. So by definition you only collect data from those who have access to these technologies. And if these group of people who have access to these technologies, which is a huge amount of uh, people, probably a huge share of our society, um, but if these people are fundamentally different from those who are excluded from that technology, that gives you a very, very screwed picture of, the, of reality. Because you only then summarise the traits or characteristics of that group and completely disregard the characteristics of the other. So it gives you a tilted view of reality, both perceived on a subject basis, on a subject level, um, and also um, then it becomes dangerous if that's perceived both by government and by corporations. Mm -hmm. you're obviously concerned with um, both with using or analysing that data for your own research um, and as someone who provides that data by having a mobile phone, by having a Wi-Fi uh, connection at home and here, using browser data, using Google, um, is both, yes, who owns that data, who uses that data, who uses that data for what purpose. And as an academic, whatever research you do, um, you have to reflect on the moral implications of what you're doing. So if, you, if you, you're not allowed to use data that has been collected in an immoral way, meaning that if you use data that has been collected without the consent of the people um, that have provided that data, you're in big trouble. That's a direct violation of any of your ethical um, guidelines. Um, and I think in many ways right now the lines are being blurred between what is consent in, in, in providing that data and what is not. Um, for instance, Google, if you, if, I mean, every sec second time you, you use Google uh, Chrome, it always asks you to agree to the new terms of, of use. Um, and I'm sure most will agree that um, you just don't have the time to every second day read through pages and pages of the terms of use. And you absolutely, in the, your everyday life, you work as a researcher as well as any other profession probably, you fully dependent on search engines and probably also on Google because it's still one of the best running algorithms when it comes to online searching. Um, so obviously on a, on a legal basis, you can claim every data that's collected by Google has been collected via consent because 
you excluded from that service if you don't consent. But that's not consent in the way how um, academics would see it. Because you provide, you, you can't exclude someone from a service if, and may, or make the provision of that service conditional on the consent of taking part in a survey. Um, but as, as an analyst, you often also use secondary data. Um, and then it becomes very difficult if you don't personally collect that data, it becomes very difficult to, um, to know whether that data has been collected in line with your own um, kind of ethical guidelines and standards. Um, and I mean, the, the data I'm using personally is uh, data that's provided by governments. So they have to perform uh, their data collection in line with very strict ethical guidelines. Well, corporations, they set their own ethical guidelines, right? So corporations might have a very uh, different understanding of these, which are still legal, but again, like legal and moral, uh, or what's legal and what's ethical, is not always kind of completely, uh, completely equal. Um, so yeah, it might, it might, all of this collection might be legal, but it might still be perceived as unethical for um, any academic research. Mm -hmm.